Oh, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to episode 914 of Flow Wrestling Radio Live. I'm your host, Christian Piles. Joined today by JD and JD alone. He's here. That's all we need. Ben is, who knows what he's doing. He's on vacation, but that could mean anything. It could mean anything with him. I don't know. I forget where he said he's going. Right somewhere. St. Louis. St. Louis? Or with the St. Lunatics. For vacation? All right, that's a first. Well, good for him. I think his wife's from uh, Missouri. No, she's from Kansas City. Who knows? Exactly. There's the mystery of Ben. We don't know where he is. Plenty to get to today. However, we've got, we got a, a little inside scoop on the rules. It's a rules year. We talked about that at some point between NCAs and now. And uh, we got a copy of what's on the, uh, I guess, the ballot. We'd call it JD. Yeah, yeah, ballot. We love the rules. We love talking rules. Big rules, guys. Here we change. All them. wrestling fans love talking rules. They really do. It's kind of like one of the nerdiest aspects of wrestling fandom is how much we love the rules. Like I feel like no other sport are rules in general talked about more. Maybe some specific rule. Yeah. Something will happen. Like the NFL. Is the this football. a catch? Is this not a catch? Yeah. But it all hones in on this one rule. Wrestling fans just love to talk about we're, all, we're the all the rules. All the rules are just a fun time for, for wrestling fans. It's, um, you know, it's great. So we'll get to that. We'll get to, uh, we talked Hodge, right? Mm-hmm. We talked yep. Hodge. Well, did we? I mean, we said Mason won. Okay. On Monday? No. Was it out there that he had won on Monday? No. We hadn't. My real life bleeds into this show that, too much. We did, Tyler? Okay, Tyler's certain. He would know better than us. Here's the thing. We just basically FRL is our lives. We're just FRLing here. We're FRLing at the office. We're FRLing on Slack. We're just always talking about the HAP. So it is sometimes hard to forget. But what we didn't talk about is, is Car Strachi, not pleased that he did not win the Hodge. Um, he hit the, uh, the Hodge tweet from the NCA with a with a quote tweet and an LMAO. And with the LMAO, I'm not even going to tell you what that stands for, <laughs> but you could look it up. Uh, but I don't think he was actually laughing. Not pleased that he didn't win. Carter will be the uh, favorite to win next year, I would assume. I mean, he got second in the voting. He did, um, and so he's both got- the fan and the uh, ballot vote. Yes. So he will have a he will have a chance to win next next year. Now we did talk about on Monday, uh, maybe even a little more in depth than Mason winning the Hodge was Strachy going heel. Yes, which he is clearly just doing again. Yes. he probably does feel that way. In my opinion, he he like, he feels like he should have won. Yeah, you know, as I'm sure several of the um, candidates did. And then he was like, "Well, I'm going to use this moment to." Uh, you know, the heel guy, the heel guy. Yeah. Yeah. So just kind of more, more confirmation of that, but he's, he's got a great chance of, of winning it next year and the year after that. And I actually saw, I've had this thought like only since NCAAs um, of, of Carter, his eligibility, him kind of putting it in question, even coming back next year. I was like, well, yes, of course he's coming back next year. But then Brock uh, Height tweeted kind of in response to our conversation about the will Carter, won't Carter return, was like, isn't it kind of obvious? It's just like a, it's a kind of strategy around NIL, which, oh yeah, duh, that does make a lot of sense. Like, you know what, if you want me to come back, then. Pay this man his money. Yeah. And it's honestly a really, really smart strategy. I think we'll, I think we'll see it more and more. Um, Roman talked about it for him to return this year. Obviously, Roman and Carter are friends and, and, uh, and teammates, etc. So I think um, maybe there's a little bit of an angle there to get a little extra compensation, which get yours, I say. Tanner Huffman in the chat says, Carter shaping up to be a great heel going to get booed all next year. You think? I don't think he'll get booed. I don't think he'll get booed. Unless he does something very provocative. Uh, He's got like- to turn it up. Yeah. He's got to go into enemy territory and get a, a little wild with it. Now, Does Penn State going, wrestling Carver next yes. year? He will get booed there. <laughs> he will get booed there, bigly. Um, bigly? But, yeah, bigly. Means, like, a lot. Uh, 
probably would have gone with loudly, but no, it's bigly. Um, so yeah, I think he'll get booed some. I think he will probably be the biggest heel next year in, in college wrestling. If he has his way, he will be. <laughs> we know that much. Uh, so that's Hodge. Congrats to Mason. Other so what Hawkeye fans really should do is cheer extremely loud for him. Oh, re- that'll really show him. Exactly. It's not working, Carter. Reverse you're psychology. Actually, you're our favorite. If they could, if they he could get on the, the same, booze. Yeah. So you're just giving him what he wants, Iowa fans. So don't boo him. You have to cheer loudly. You have to give him a standing ovation. Salute him. That's the only way <laughs> you can really show. Show your, him nothing but respect. Yeah, show him nothing but respect. Um. Uh, Quick transition, uh, NIU's Isaac Olejnik is in the transfer portal. He placed this year out of the 12 seed, got eighth. At the toughest weight class. At the toughest weight. He beat Carson Hartzla to place in the round of 12, rode him, and that was the difference there. In the portal, do you know, James, how many years of eligibility he has remaining? He has one year left. One year. So Two years left. Okay. I think. It's doubling by the minute. <laughs> so he's in the portal. Kind of, I mean, this is like the aspect of the portal that like, I don't know, sort of sort of bugs me. Not like, I'm not judging, and I don't obviously know anyone's situation when they transfer generally, but it's like this is what, you know, NIU takes Isaac Olesnik, who, you know, I don't think was on any big board whatsoever. He was he, not. Gets on the podium places uh at the, at the toughest weight in the country and then it's like all right let me go ahead and, and leave i'm not judging the decision i'm just saying just in general these smaller programs it's a really big deal for them to get guys on the podium and then if if they just use them as a stepping stone to get to a different school or situation it does bum me out because i want i want the i'm not trying to get parody or anything like that i want but i do want these teams when they have these uh, but they get these all Americans to be able to kind of reap their rewards and and keep those guys and use that as maybe to generate some momentum for their program so that they can have some more. So it is kind of a disappointing outcome. Now Oleshnik is a graduate transfer, mm-hmm. which obviously changes things. Yeah, but like you said, we don't know the situation. We don't know the situation. Literally, they might not have his graduate program. That could be. That's a thing that often happens as well. So. Uh, no judgment. He's Hope certain. Isaac finds a good home. Yeah. And he uh, may not leave. He's just in the portal. That's right. Tough situation for uh, NIU as well as Feldkamp. Went there for four years, transferred to Clarion and All-American. Yeah. Is Feldkamp in the portal? No, but he oh, was oh. He was there and then transferred two years ago. He was there for four years. Oh, wow. And then All-American for Clarion this year. Dang. Uh, okay, so Alejnik, no other portal news, no uh, no new additions, I don't think, and we haven't heard any news of wrestlers transferring elsewhere. It's so early in the transfer, the portal season, that I think it'll be a while before we see uh, the big name guys committing to somewhere else as they basically get a whole second recruitment process. Yes. Now, so why not shop around for? A month. My mama told me you better shop around. <laughs> so they should listen to the mothers. We'll see where he goes. Sad news for Iowa Wesleyan. The whole school's done. Not just the wrestling program. The school is shutting down. And uh, so that means some wrestling teams will no longer exist either. So sad situation there. COVID was not kind to mm-hmm. a, a lot of universities. And uh, I think Iowa Wesleyan's just a... A casualty of that so big bummer big bummer there okay i've waited long enough i made it 10 minutes without talking about these rules jd <laughs> that's a new world record uh so do you want to tee up kind of what you got and then we can kind of go through it yeah so a coach sent these to me it's it's a ballot of possible rule changes i'm not exactly sure if uh so the vote is actually due by tomorrow mm. um and so stuff the ballot box. Yeah, a panel of coaches, commissioners, athletic directors uh, get to vote on these. And I don't know if that's like an official. I think this then puts them up to be 
um, possibly changed. I don't think the vote is hard and fast. If all these people approve it, it gets changed. But we got a ballot here of, what, 10 possible rule changes or so, or eight. That uh, It's always fun to get into the rule changes. Yeah. So let's get into them. Uh, there's some of less impact on the wrestling, some more impact. But they're all, they're literally all interesting to me, uh, including the one that's just basically eliminating headgear as a requirement. So it would make headgear optional. I don't have a, a an opinion on that other than if they don't wear it in practice, just wearing it in competition doesn't make a lot of sense to me because practice is when you're going to do the damage to the to the ears. Um, <clears throat> the, there are some programs who I know require headgear throughout all of practice. It would be interesting to see. Do you keep that rule if you don't have to wear it in competition? Yeah, I don't know. I, uh, yeah, I don't feel strongly about this one. I know some people feel very strongly yeah. about getting rid of it. Um, it to me, it was always um, headgear definitely helps prevent cauliflower ear. So if there's something that you can show moms, hey, look, this thing will help prevent your son or daughter from having ugly ears, and that makes them more likely to put their kid in the sport, then that's fine with me. To me, they're beautiful. <laughs> it's it's not a big deal to wear it. Some people really hate wearing their headgear. I never found it to be that big of a deal. Yeah. But uh, I didn't when I didn't have to. So. Yeah. Okay. Here's a big one. Changing the medical forfeit in a tournament to a loss on the wrestler's individual season record. Before we get this one, Brady brings up a good um, point in the chat. No headgear spikes, though. <sighs> I'm not sure I'm ready to lose them. That uh, Andrew Lira spike? That was good. No one's ever got on the uh, younger level in terms of height, but there was, a lot, true. there was a lot of heat on that one. Here's the thing. Now do coaches start carrying headgear in the corner, headgear tossed to the athlete <laughs> to set up the spike? We could have alley-oops, spikes, um, that, but that's a great point, and that's, that should be considered when you vote. But medical forfeits being lost, and they have a little, they put the rule change and then they put the rationale. Rationale, to reinforce the importance of communication between wrestler coach and medical personnel, ensure wrestlers are properly rehabilitated before registering them to compete in a tournament. Also, to better reflect the rest, wrestler's true competition record, but not unnecessarily penalize them with multiple losses for medical forfeits that could occur in the consolation bracket. So I don't know what that means. It means, like, your first loss... Is a loss. Is a loss, but then your second loss on the backside doesn't go on your record. Oh, why? Um, to as it says, to better reflect the wrestler's true competition record, but not not unnecessarily penalize them with multiple losses on the backside. So, say you're Jason Nolf. What if you lose top side and then medical forfeit out? Is it your first loss or yes, your first loss goes on your record. You would have officially lost to that man, but you don't get. Penalize, you don't get the loss on the backside on your record. So right. say... What if you lose regularly in the top side and then you just... Your first one. Your first loss, no matter what. Okay. And that goes on your record, no matter who it is. That goes mm. on your record as a loss. And their skill level is affected into your RPI. Yeah. But not the subsequent loss. That's fair. I think I think it would drastically change the how many forfeits we see, for sure, if those start going in. As losses. For um, sure. And I think that is a... Um, a fair compromise. Yes, and a better reflection of your level. Yeah. If your health is in question, and you think, if I go out there, uh, I may not win, or I could get hurt um, further, you're going to have to decide, is it worth it to wrestle or take this loss? Yeah. And like if if you're not hundred if you are compromised, and then you shouldn't get credit for like if you would lose. That's the state of where you're at currently. Yeah, yeah. I I think it's I think it's a good thing. I think this could have a huge impact to the negative of at the opens in terms of participation. If you looked at some of those November opens, dudes were rolling up with the intent of getting two matches and then forfeiting out. So, do you see those? I mean, from a fan's perspective, though, who cares? Like, well, I'm I'm not saying it bothers me. I'm saying 
the whole point is there will be fewer participants if they're like, well, we can't forfeit out of this thing without penalty anymore, so we're just not going to go. Uh, we saw a lot of that in the early opens. I wouldn't be surprised to see it manifest itself even more. Um, but could we could see guys just finish the tournament that they entered, which is perhaps novel yeah. in the, today's day and age. And So maybe it would be better for situations like that. Maybe we wouldn't get to see some of the top guys, but um, and this is from a fan's perspective, like I said, <clears throat> not from an athlete's perspective, but from a fan's perspective, doesn't really affect me to go see insert X national finalist go be two far lower level dudes yeah. and then forfeit out. Okay. That's not enjoyable. Yeah. Next one uh, was not a thing that I even realized, but changing the penalty for delayed coaches re- video review challenge request to a loss of the video review. So I guess the previous penalty, if you waited too long to throw the brick, was a control of mat violation and a team point deduction. So insane. Uh, to now you just lose a challenge if you do that, which I didn't know that was a thing, what honestly. What is the time length for delayed? I don't, I don't know if there's actually a number to it um, that I've ever so it seen. It definitely is in freestyle. It went to the court of law. <laughs> there is now. Um but there wasn't before, you know. I thought there was in the Zane, um, no Yanni one because that's why that's why I went to court. Yeah, there was there was maybe something in some rule. Some it was five seconds. Right? Yeah, yeah, I, but I don't think so. It's like I, I I'm don't. Pretty sure that was the whole thing. Was it was definitely after? Yeah, I don't know. We litigated that entire thing. Now I don't even remember it. But um. Yeah, there's maybe some sort of length, but it, it was always more nuanced than that. But yeah, get the bricks out there. Don't wait. Uh, and no team points. And th- this is a whole thing. There's a team point theme here. Let me, fi- I'm going to skip around. Team point. Hold on, control. Dang it. My command F is, skills are not working. All right, we'll get to it. You know what? We're just going to keep rolling through it. Uh, next one. Uh, I- I have no opinion on this, so it's fine. Go ahead and read it. No, I'm talking about the the delayed coaches review. Yeah, no, no we don't see it anyways. Yeah, and we're just saying, just don't take team points anymore. All right, changing the traditional stalling call for passivity to a penalty that is not eligible for video review challenge. Uh, so apparently, you could challenge stalling, and they'd say, no, we don't want you to be able to challenge stalling. Um, traditional. And- Traditional stalling. The highly subjective nature of the traditional stalling call makes it impractical to be listed as an eligible item for video review. Note, the neutral out-of-bounds stalling penalty would still be allowed to be video review challenge. So the back-out stall, you could look at that. Also the drop-down, I would assume. I would assume anything that involves counting. We love counting stall calls. Um, In wrestling, they like making those things reasons to count to five. They love them. (laughs) So maybe that would be challengeable, but beyond that, um, they're eliminating that. And I can't think, and J.D. and I were thinking before the show, I can't think of a single example of a stall call being challenged from neutral that fit that criteria, but I'm certain it happened. Yeah, I'm sure. We see traditional stalling called so infrequently now at the college level, I feel like, that it doesn't arise that much. When it is, it is normally quite obvious. Here's the Ben Asker and Anthony Roby rule. Reducing the number of tournament advancement points and or bonus points provided in the consolation bracket of an individual team or team advancement event. So I don't know what the actual change is. It's just changing the numbers. Uh, it says to reduce and or eliminate the ability for third, fifth, or seventh place wrestler to earn more team points than the champion wrestler in that weight class. Modifying the rules in the offensive. Yeah, so... I don't, it doesn't say like how they will modify advancement, bonus points, and consolation bracket, but that they will change it so that the third placer cannot outscore the champion, which happened. Which I think on Monday we all agreed. There is no scenario where that should happen, so yeah. this would probably be a good rule change. This, this is Ben Askren taking points out of Wyatt Hendrickson, from Wyatt Hendrickson. That's, that's how you know it's Is for ben. every national champion not a team player? Because they didn't lose first round and pin their way to third place and score more team points. I've been saying that for a while now. They are not team players. 
I mean, the, the proof score? is in the pudding. It's in. It's right there. You were literally not scoring the maximum number of team points. Yeah. For your team, failures. Well, most of them. Well, actually, I guess if you pin most your of them, to, if you pin your way to first, you you still beat it. But. That's a good point. <laughs> that's why they're not team players. You should just pin everyone. Um. Before we move on, the one above, you get to I write in. Are the is there any rules that you think should be ineligible for review that mm. you currently can? Mm. And should you be able to challenge a pin? Yeah. No. <laughs> because if you have somebody He's that so, if you have somebody that so close to their back, oh yeah. Like you can't just restart with somebody on their back. And if they call a pin and then that person gets off of their back, you don't watch jujitsu. They restart they those do. guys. And they, I know. <laughs> they drag them around. They pull them to the it's center. Funny. It is. It's they really just butt scoot like a dog that has fleas. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. People love that. Okay, so that was funny. Ah, uh, I don't know. Okay. What if you could only challenge that someone was pinned and then you go back and say, oh. Yes, that I'm in favor for. That's kind of cool. It's totally impractical and you shouldn't be able to do one and not and the other. And then it also cause screenshot pins. Heck yeah. I love it. <laughs> Let's get it going. <laughs> screenshot pins. So many Gramby guys getting pinfalled. Uh, but no, there's a time requirement for that. But And what else? I don't know. Dude, you know what they I don't think is in here is the dumb rear standing takedown no reaction time gimmick. Oh yeah. Why is that not on the ballot? That should at least be on the ballot. That's a terrible rule. You shouldn't have to have some big lobbyists in here want rear standing takedowns. What is so what's the angle there? <laughs> you gotta follow the money for these rear standing takedowns. Okay. Next one. Modifying the rules in the offensive top position. To require the wrestler to work toward obtaining near fall points and a pin. Yeah. You should be trying to work for near fall or a pin. Now, that is insanely subjective, but that's okay. I think there's uh I think there is a lot of uh, negativity around the word subjective and because it's not clear, but I think that's good. It's okay that it's subjective. And it because it requires you to just think about what am I actually seeing here? What am I watching from neutral when these guys, when one guy is not taking an attack and not trying to score? Okay, you're, you're, you're witnessing stalling, but you won't call it because, because there's objective rules that you're waiting for. If we should increase the subjectivity and your opinion, right? And have the opinions and, and have officials be experts of the sport. That's what you should have. You should have people that know what they're seeing. You know when a guy in neutral is not trying to score. You know when a guy on top is not trying to turn. We all know it. There's no way everyone in the crowd knows it. Everyone on the sideline knows it. Everyone on the team knows it. And the, the refs don't. No, they know too. They just don't want to do it. So I say you increase the subjectivity and say, no, we do want your opinion on this. And we want you to make a call. Maybe that is high in the sky to think that, that that's possible. But I... I choose to think it is possible. We all know what stalling is, so call it. Uh, I mean, yes, we all know what stalling is, but what about a scenario where bottom guy's not working that hard, top guy's not working that hard? Listen, in the Shenandoah Valley, doubles. doubles let's Th go. Throw them up. <laughs> throw them up. Let's go. Um, yeah, if no one's working, then no one's working. Then, then hit them both. Everyone should be trying to score. You th And that's where... And that's where the subjectivity comes in. It's like, okay, this guy has double legs in. He's completely flattened out like this. You, you, I don't think you can really hit that guy for stalling because they're so you're so limited by what you can do. The burden is on the top guy to be working for turns, and if he works for a turn, that will create opportunities for the guy to clear, get his hips away, whatever. And then he, the burden is on him to work out and the other guy to turn. And that's great. Um, so it all comes down to like understanding the scenario, understanding the position. This is something that Ben harps on a lot. Like they should, with a, with minimal education, the, the refs can have knowledge of the positions and most of them do. A lot of them are coaches. A lot of them are former wrestlers. They know what they're seeing. They aren't some ignorant, they're not ignorant to the sport. They know what's going on and they know deep down in their hearts what that they're stalling, but there's just like this unwritten, or maybe partially written agreement that like, 
hey, we're just not really calling this kind of stall anymore. You got to wait to the third period when the guy losing is is coming just as hard as he was in the first period, mind you, uh, to to call stalling. Well, right now the rules literally say you don't have to work towards a fall. What on top? Fall. On top. On top. So, like, you're working towards the writing time point. But on yes, but on new in neutral, it's that's where it is. And you know what drives me crazy about the neutral subjectivity is like, all right. I'm wrestling JD. Uh, JD's coming at me really hard. He's trying to score, trying to score. He gets some takedowns on me early. I'm not trying to score at the end. Okay, I get off the bottom and I keep it kind of close. Then the last 30 seconds, I'm down by like one or two. And it's I'm, called way different. And I'm going after him. And now JD's stalling after working the whole match to score. And that plays out. The refs do that all the time. And that, that drives me nuts. So they'll use the subjectivity there at the end of the match, but at the beginning of the match, when stalling is just as prevalent. Uh, Situational stalls. Yeah. That's what it is. It's not good. So just, just call it all the time, and it'll, it would be great. Um, I think it's fine. And I think if stalling became more commonly called, it wouldn't be this huge, huge deal. And also, you get a warning, right? You can get warned without penalty. So it's not like this the biggest deal in the world. So, yeah. I think the top wrestlers should be working to – the goal is a pin. So you should be working for uh, a pin. You should be working for near fall. That's that's fair. So please do that. Now, if we skip skip the next one, um, how do you feel about this one? Implementing a mandatory stalemate call in the offensive-defensive position before calling either wrestling for stalling. The rationale is to provide the referee an opportunity to communicate to both wrestlers – the expectation of aggressive wrestling in both the offensive and defensive positions before penalizing either wrestler. Disagree, because uh, I think there's nothing prohibiting the ref from doing that in real time. And that's something that's sort of common. You hear the the referees, you see it in high school all the time, like bottom man got to work. I mean, they kind of like give those verbal cues that are like, that are actual warnings before they get, they intervene. Like, Tell the top guy, top man, you got to work for something. Bottom man, you got to, you don't have to say build up, but some sort of terminology that says in the moment, and they can hear it, right? Um, you get down there and you yell at them. And then that's the thing. And you don't have to disrupt the flow of the match. And you don't have to bail out the bottom guy if he's broken down flat. You don't have to penalize the top guy or vice versa, whatever's going on. Um, I don't think that's necessary. I think you should empower the refs to just talk to the, the wrestlers in the match, which is not uncommon. No, yeah, I agree. I do think there's a time and a place for a stalemate call in uh, you know when referee's they, position. They love calling the stalemate in the tiebreakers. Boom, you get a breakdown, maybe a legs in. I mean, they did this to Dayton Fix it, uh, against Soriano. Mm-hmm. He got the breakdown with legs in. They hit him with the stalemate quick. You would never see that in the second or third period. Um, but I do think that is a scenario where you could – you should see a stalemate. Guy slips, double boots in, breaks the guy down. He's he's working for power half, can't get it. I don't think then the top guy should be penalized if he can't turn him from that position for breaking that guy down, get in there. And if you're in bottom there, you're pretty much stuck. Yeah. I think that is a position that warrants a stalemate okay. versus top guy or bottom guy getting hit for stalling. I understand. Um. Okay, the other one. This is the big one. Implementing a push-out rule in the neutral position where one point is given to the opponent, the opposing wrestler steps out of the competition circle with at least one foot. So basically, this is straight up the freestyle step-out rule. There's nothing in there about continuation and all that grounding, but um, I would assume they would get sort of specific there. I don't even know if it has to be a point, an auto point. I, I was kind of in favor of a warning than point for stalling, whatever, but... Honestly, it probably would be better if it was just like straight freestyle yep. step out rule. I would love it. They should call it a step out, not a push out. But I, I think it's great. I think it would be awesome. I think it'd be a, out of bounds can't be safety. Period. And it is. It's a great place to go. You see guys turning, kicking away. Now that gets penalized. That's good. I mean, I I hate how much. I hate the turn, kick, turn, kick. Then you square up on the on the edge. And the guy can't pull you back in, and you just start pulling with all your might to get out of bounds. Um, guys, it gets rid of the gimmick of 
Let me, can I get a hand on a carpet? Can I get my hand off the mat? Can I get this, my other foot that's not being attacked off the mat? And there's no penalty for that whatsoever. Like it eliminates so many like kind of bad scenarios and just rewards offense, rewards guys trying to score. Not going to turn into, you can't, like back in the day, you could be like, oh yeah, it would turn it into sumo or whatever. But we literally have thousands and hundreds of thousands of matches of freestyle where it's not that. It's literally not that. So you can't. There's a lot of pushing on the edge and freestyle to try and get your. I would not call them. I wouldn't call it sumo. I wouldn't call them like push outs. And you can't do the straight arm push thing. Um, Okay. You can't go straight arm, but you can run your shoulder into them and drive them out, which is awesome, by the way. It's great action on the edge. It's very entertaining. Everybody that talks bad about we would turn into sumo. You ever seen sumo? Sumo kicks ass. (laughs) Oh, yeah. That's a good point. There's probably more fans of sumo than actual wrestling. Oh, yeah. Um, okay. So, so I, it, it would make a lot of people angry, though. This one will not pass. No. It, too, many, too, many people, uh-uh. too many people in the wrestling world that well, yeah, uh, that's the thing. It's up don't want to change. It's up to the coaches. Why are the coaches making the rules? Why? Because theoretically, they know the sport best. Yeah, they ha- they're the most biased people when it comes to it. <laughs> Everything is about how it affects them. It's not about, what, is it better? Is it a better product? No one thinks about that. Like, I don't know. I mean, there should be coach input, but like, I, like I've said for years on this show, coaches make all the decisions in this sport. Like, not just NCAA, internationally, senior level. Coaches make all the decisions uh, for, for wrestling. And it's like, man, you know, in some instances, it's helpful and good, but when you're trying to move a sport forward and you have this, I mean, agenda sounds like a bad thing. It's like, no, it is in your best interest professionally for certain things to play out a certain way. Like, ever, that's understood, right? Um, so, yeah, I don't think we're going to see the step out. Um, but I would like to. We would love it. All right, standardizing weigh-in times across all competition types. This one's sort of confusingly worded, but it says uh, the rationale, standardizing weigh-in times across all competition types will allow wrestlers to develop pre-match routines that work for all competition types. So it's like basically it's the or sooner that confused me. So yes, 120 minutes or sooner before the start time of competition. Option two, yes, 90 minutes or sooner. No, make change. Uh, make no change to weigh-in times, uh, or no opinion. So I, I think it should just be straight two-hour weigh-in, all the time. Just like stick with that. Stick with the tournament. It's how the NCAs are. I don't understand like why it's hour for for duels, two hours for um, tournaments. That doesn't make sense to me. So I, I yeah, think that, that never made sense to me. And there should be no like time constraints, like oh, it's hard to get there two hours before, or do it like like that. Um, I think it should just be one hour wins. One hour? Yes. No, two hours. No, we shouldn't go back. We shouldn't. No, I don't like the short weigh-in windows. I think that's uh, that's not cool. Why? I give them two hours. Give them two hours to recover, dude. If you're man, if you make weight and you're the first match up. Also, it's like so. Well, that's the point. It's supposed to uh, not um, it's supposed to inhibit weight cutting. But there, so you think they should be all? Well, it's not even an option to have all. You can't have an hour weigh in before a tournament. They don't even allow it. I right it's not now even, currently it's not even proposed. So um, yeah, I think I think it should be whatever it is. It should be the same for tournament and duel. And you're not going to see hour weigh-ins for tournaments, so just do two hours for all competitions. Why no one hour weigh-in for tournaments? We do it for duels. Well, that's not on the ballot. Well, what does or sooner mean? Or sooner means sooner, like not closer to the competition. It means like... Sooner to the competition. No, that's not what that means. Sooner, 120 minutes or sooner means like... You even said you don't know what or sooner means. I know what it means. (laughs) I figured it out. Um, so yeah, I think just uniform two hour wins. What are the people saying? Uh, Avery Gaming agrees with me. He sounds smart. They're saying don't freestyle up my folk style. Oh really? <laughs> like if you can come, I know um, that's going to be the number one uh, contrary opinion 
to the push out is don't freestyle at my folk style. Number mm-hmm. two is going to be you lose good scrambles on the edge. If oh, yeah. you can show me, provide me data that there are more good scrambles on the edge than there are guys using the out of bounds edge as a as a boundary. Come on, because there is way more action on the edge in freestyle. Because guys literally go, oh no, I am in danger of giving up points here. And we'll do everything they can to circle back in. Yeah. Wow, Keith Gothard's waiting. He thinks one hour is enough. And a heavyweight thinks one hour is enough recovery time. <laughs> this is, that's a uh, very, We very, literally do it for duels. Very helpful take, Keith. I'm Where right. most of these guys wrestle their, their uh, the most, most of the, the bulk of their matches in the season. No. That, well, that's a fact. Well, I know they do, but that's not a reason to do that. I think it should align with the championship format. Well, if the championship format was one hour. Well, that's never going to happen. <laughs> well, why not? <laughs> All right, we're, just, we're literally talking in circles at this point about that. But why do you really think that um, the one hour is, it... is not enough for a tournament format? A tournament mm-hmm. where after their wins at NCAAs, what's the most matches they wrestle? In a day. Is it two or three? Depends on if you lose. Well, three. at NCAA is one thing, but like at some of these opens or other tournaments, you can get, you can do five in one day. You think you are that much more likely to get hurt if you only have a one-hour weigh-in versus a two-hour weigh-in? I'm not saying hurt or whatever. I just think they should have enough time to fully recover. An hour is a, not a lot of time to like eat, drink, get dressed, warm up, all that stuff. Like You're literally rushing to rehydrate yourself. But that's the point. Part of the point, but the other, but only it only really affects one weight. One twenty-five. Yeah, it affects them the most. Like it should have equal. Um. Well, it never will because tournaments will always start at one twenty-five. All right, fine. Let's do it, Matt side. <laughs> Just weigh them in before everyone. I don't hate it. <laughs> IBJJF kind of does that. They freaking now. There's still guys cutting weight, but like, they are like. The worst look, you should see some of these guys. They're like uh, going onto the mat, but then they. Is that where Mikey Musmechi made like one? Barely. 30 one, or whatever? Yeah, it was like 25. 125. Like, he's, yeah, he's. They don't have like any real rules, I think, about weight cutting or anything like that. It's just like whatever. If you can make it, congrats. We'll see you out on the mats. But those guys can. I don't know that I would say they recover, but the, the skill discrepancies for the big weight cutters are so vast in. Jiu-jitsu, that they can just go out there and like even if they're dead, they'll just beat these guys. And then, then a lot of times they only have one match on day one, and then day two they're like big and strong. Yeah, There's and only ob- one way in. And obviously, you couldn't do mat side way ins throughout a tournament. No, like you literally just can't. You dare could do mat side for your first match though. Dare to dream. And that's your that's your way in for the day. That would be cool. Um, all right, is that all the rules? I thought there was another one. Um, oh yeah, here's the big one. Freaking allowing the sauna. Free the sauna. Now, this one is easy. Well, it says except for 48 hours prior to all team and individual dates of competition. Yes. And fine. Um, I've, gone, I've gone on my sauna rant a few times on this show about why I think saunas should be allowed for, for college wrestlers and all athletes, really. And my whole thing with it is, okay, the examples of why you should not use the sauna are examples of people using the sauna in a way it is not intended to be used, right? And so the element of danger existing around something is not a reason to prohibit something full stop, right? Like it is, if you improperly lift weights, they're very, very, very dangerous for you and you get horribly, horribly injured, right? But that's not a reason to get rid of weight rooms. Um, Similarly, the, and, and eliminate the benefits of weight training and strength training. Similarly, saunas have incredible benefits. And if they are abused, are very, very dangerous. And that, that goes without saying. But I think, one, there's also the dynamic of a lot of these teams have saunas in their facilities. And guess what? They all use them anyways. It's not policed at all. Has anyone ever... I've never heard of anyone getting in trouble for, for sauna use in the last couple of years. Um, so one, it's happening as is anyway, which I say, I say good, but quit trying to pretend that it's not happening. Um, and I think it's safer 
to say, hey, yeah, you can use a sauna. Here's why you use this sauna. Here's what it's for. You don't wheel the exercise bikes in there. You don't put an airdyne in there. You don't put plastics on in there. Unless you want to get tough. Right? Unless you want to get really tough and be awesome at wrestling. Just kidding. Um, no. And that's where the coaches and the staff have to be like, yeah, that's that's under their purview. They need to make sure that the saunas are being used in a, in a healthy way. And I also feel, and, and if you don't know, it's like, man, the, the reason this rule exists is it, it makes sense, right? Like there were there were literally deaths associated with sauna in wrestling. Um, and there were guys on in plastics, on bikes, dehydration, creatine, the whole thing. And there, there were deaths. It's horrible. It was, it's a tragedy. And so the obvious thing is like, oh, let's get rid of these things um, and get rid of the sauna. And so I understand why it happened, but I don't think I don't I I think at this point it's misguided. And I'll also say like the 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 crash weight cuts with the with the plastics and all that stuff we're describing, I feel like the the research and the the I don't think we're seeing as much of that anymore in, in the collegiate ranks because I think these coaches know how prohibitive it is to strong performance, right? It is not you're not gonna if you do that, if you're on a on a bike and in plastics and all this stuff right before weigh-ins, and then you go wrestle. You're you're taking that much water out that far before competition. You're gonna compete really poorly. So for that reason, and and just like college wrestlers should get the the benefits of 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 sauna, the recovery, how it helps your immune system. And there's there's study after study for how a sauna can help you and how it can especially help an athlete. So. To not have that available for wrestlers uh, because of, you know, previous abuse of the thing doesn't make any sense to me. You should you should outlaw sweats by that logic. You should outlaw airdynes because they can be abused and be dangerous, but only if used improperly. So I don't think there's any any argument that can be made, but I think here's why I don't think it's going to pass. Because all these player hater coaches that don't have saunas are be like, well, we don't have a sauna. So I don't want Iowa or this team or that team to have this advantage because they already have a sauna in their facility. So they'll be like, no, 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 we don't want this because they'll say it's for safety. But really, it's because they're just player haters because they all use a sauna. They want a sauna. And the other reason they should exist is because if you don't have a sauna, well, you can find a sauna. You can find a, you can go to a 24 hour fitness or maybe your buddy's got one or something like that. And then you could do it without any supervision outside of the university supervision. And then who knows what you're going to do? Cause you're a college kid and you're desperate and your, your weight's out of control and you don't want your coaches to know. So you're going to do something dangerous. So for all those reasons, you should allow the saunas and everyone that votes, no, it's not for health. It's cause you're a player hater. That's what I'm saying. Declared player hater. Free the sauna, allow them. Thank you for attending my TED Talk. All right. I don't think uh, any more has to be What's said. What's Keith Gothard say about that? I think he might be in the pocket of Big Sauna. He says I'm so naive. No. Yeah. Um, I I hope they do it. I think it would be great. Um, saunas are good. Are good things. I love the sauna. You're a sauna guy. I'm a sauna man. Yeah. It's great. Do you ever do anything? Be up, be honest. Do you ever do anything crazy in the sauna to make weight? Uh, never anything crazy. Definitely sat in the sauna. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Right. Let's go to now that we've changed all the rules of wrestling. Our next uh, U.S. Open entries are heating up. We're still like a month away, almost exactly a month. It's uh less than a month technically from the U.S. Open in Las Vegas. It is going to be. Probably, I'll say like the best U.S. Open since like mm, 2017, where we had Dake Burroughs and a number of other awesome weights because it sets the table for Final X. If you win it at a not uh, at a medalist weight, you're automatically in Final X. So the stakes are very very high for a lot of especially mm-hmm. men's freestyle weights. Uh, and the entries are are picking up. They're already pretty tough uh, considering how far out we are and the fact that. The, the final entries come in like a week, the week of, generally. I mean, this one's almost like 
obvious because at most of the men's freestyle weights, it's ipso facto the world team trials. Mm-hmm. What has been the world team trials the past couple of years? Yes. So. Ipso facto. So I'll just scan through some of the names that are interesting to me. This is not an exhaustive list. You can see the exhaustive list on Flow Wrestling. Uh, it's on the homepage right now. Uh, at 57, Nick Soriano is there. He's entered Sunkiss Kids Wrestling Club. We'll also see Jacob Camacho return to the mat at 57, which is exciting. He missed mm-hmm. this season recovering from injury. ACL, I believe it was. ACL, yes. At not six- the music festival. <laughs> not the music festival. <laughs> if he was still, if he needed a year to recover from that music festival, I'd say there's some lifestyle choices for <laughs> Jacob to reevaluate. Uh, at 61, proud loper. That's right. Daniel DeShazer. Let's go with that. Going to be up in there. Aiden Valencia. Seth Gross. Why is Aiden Valencia not doing like U20s? Like, maybe make that team. Yeah, I mean, he he's, he still could. Uh, he could uh, do both? Yes, because this only... This is just nationals. Correct. Okay. Not world team trials. This will be in Geneva, Ohio in June. I forget the exact date. It seemed like June. June At feels the right. Spire Academy. Seth. This will be cadet U17 world team trials uh, here, though. Copy that. Seth Gross in the mix, uh, along with Gabe Townsell at 61. 65, we've got Kaladzic, Ian Parker, Chad Red in the mix. 70 is interesting because you have Hayden Heidley back down at 70 kilograms, where I think he's he's a threat. He's obviously dangerous there. 70 kilos, 154 and change, mm-hmm. right? He's going to be feeling great. <laughs> uh, Ed Scott, his, his pupil, will be there, along with Tyler Berger, a former nemesis of Hayden Heidley. So 70 already taking shape. This is the weight where Zane Rutherford awaits, the, mm-hmm. the reigning world silver medalist. 74, we've got Josh Shields, Colin Puritan, Vincenzo Joseph, uh, Muhammad McBride of WVU, Quentin Perez, all in there. Max Roscoff is a blast from the past for some of you. I did not know he still wrestled. I thought he was in the jiu-jitsu scene, but uh, no, he's entered it. 79 kilograms. Shout out Chase Pammy's Gold Rush Wrestling Club. Oh, yeah. So he, he clearly lives in Las Vegas. Mm-hmm. It's like just YOLO entering. Okay. 86. Trent Heidley, Dylan Fishback, Owen Webster, all entered. Zahid Valencia is there. He is uh, one, among the favorites to make Final X. Uh, one Aaron Brooks yet to register. Penn State has not registered at all for this. Uh Neither has Iowa and many, many other teams. So still a lot of entries to come. 92 has Dudley, Tim Dudley and Eric Schultz and Nate Jackson. Uh, Nate Jackson. This feels like the longest he's gone without competing in like, <laughs> his life, maybe. But excited to watch him as he looks like a potential front runner to make the team at 92. I think Colin Moore will be there as well. I think they're probably the class of 92 with Jaden yep. moving up. Mm-hmm, definitely. 97, Isaac Trumbull is in the mix there. And then, uh, you know, that has the fewest entries, which maybe people are like, Jaden and Kyle, it's like, hmm, I should either get bigger or probably smaller. get down. <laughs> probably, probably change my weight. 125, we've got Jordan Wood, Christian Lance, Don Bradley, Owen Treffin. Christian Carroll is very interesting. It's probably the most interesting one. Yes, yeah, excited to see him. Of course, he just finished his sort of high school career. He didn't really wrestle um, last this season. He moved to Oklahoma State and now going to be uh, testing the waters at the senior level. Hayden Zilmer, the reigning world team member, once again entered here. So that's big. And then on the women's side, the biggest notable entries, Adeline Gray back uh, nine months, I believe, our producer Tyler said she had the babies in July, twins, and Kennedy Blades. So this is a showdown that we could be seeing. Um, these two wrestled in the 21 Olympic trial finals, I believe, uh, with Adeline, of course, winning that. But now Kennedy, a couple of years older and wiser, you would assume, and better. Could be uh, probably the, I think it's the most anticipated women's match of, of the U.S. Open. So. Those entries are starting to roll in. 
we'll keep those updated. I think Kozak checks them literally every day and updates them mm-hmm. as they come in. So um, there is sort of a more complicated way to find the entries on on USA Wrestling site, but we're trying to expedite it and make it easier for y'all. And uh, so, yeah, keep checking out Flow Wrestling for those entries. Um, yeah, let's go to some questions as we cruise on through the show. Um, what trials matchup in the springs do you most want to see? Well, it would probably involve 61 kilograms, you know, veto in the mix there, but it, it's, it'll, you're really not gonna be able to answer this question until after the open, because we don't know who's, someone's going to win the U S open at 61 and they won't be in the trials. So coach Chris asked this after the Shazer is going to win the U S open, but the Shazer is going to win the U S open. So not him. Uh, Seth Gross entered at 61 is interesting because we're like, is he? do we start to see some of these Olympic year 57s make the descent down? Seth Gross' answer to that was no. He's going 61. <laughs> He's like, I ain't doing that. Uh, okay. Thoughts on high school seniors skipping their senior year to train at a RTC. Will this become the norm for high-level recruits? I think it's becoming the – I think it, like, is the – I don't know if I would say it is the norm – but it is so normal to see it, uh, I would say. Mm-hmm. It, um, it's great for guys, obviously great for young wrestlers' development. But I'd be lying if I said there wasn't a part of me yeah. that is kind of sad about, um, you know, a high school state title basically no longer becoming that important for somebody. Um, even a guy like Levi Haynes, who would have won his fourth PA state title. Would he have? I don't think that's true. Did you lose one year? I don't think. Oh, uh, you're you're right. He would have been a three timer. Yeah. Um, it, it's kind of sad to see. Um, just growing up when like that was the ultimate goal was becoming a you know state champion in, in the state of Iowa. Um, but you can't blame blame a blame a kid for doing it. And if you've already surpassed the level where a high school state title is basically a a check mark. Like, yeah, go do it. I I get it. I'm I'm with you that it's like a part of me is like, man, I wish I wish they would. But how when you can? And here's the other thing about it: you can get so much high level competition as a high schooler. Not just forget the college opens. Like you can still do Super Thirty Two. You can still do all the trials. You could wrestle at Worlds. So you're not really sacrificing competition. Really, you're just going to a better training scenario. And these these wrestlers, a lot of them. I mean, Levi was called on this year to wrestle. So, you want to put yourself in in position to compete your best at college. And I mean, we we can't say for sure, but I'm guessing that Levi's decision to just train at M2 and the and the RTC at Nittany Line probably helped his performance at uh, this year. You're just kind of expediting that progress. So, I think it's. Um, I think it's going to become the norm for sure. More, and more. it may may already be the norm in a lot of ways. If you look at um, the pound for pound rankings or the big board, like I think three of the top five didn't really do states their senior year. Mm-hmm. Um, what's the opinion of kids holding back a year prior to entering high school? Asked Gavin McCarron. I'm okay with a, a hold back. I don't like you know 20 year olds wrestling in high school tournaments, but I think if you're 18 turning 19 into your senior year i think that's fine um i have no issue eh, yeah I, for the most part i'm kind of against it like you're already planning that when you're in seventh eighth grade it's yeah kinda like just go wrestle <laughs> yeah like it, it'll work out it'll be okay um, I know Ben's take on this is that the only scenario where he's okay with it if like you're literally like 89 pounds as a freshman and young. He's okay. Maybe. He he no Ben is more in favor of it I think than that. I think you're representing reasons he do, is in support of it, but like he literally like will talk to guys like, hey, I think you should do eighth grade twice. Um, and he says Wisconsin. He gets mad that Ohio has this advantage and these guys are older, and then his like Wisconsin has this culture of not holding guys back to the point where Ben's like, well, hey, I think you should consider it for this guy. Uh, okay. Next question. 
This is too many what ifs from, from Sugar, Sugar Shane Wiggins. He says, if Starachi leaves and Ferrari and Griffith go to Iowa, that has to boost them up a ton. With mixes of Keeter and Arnold. All what ifs, but possibles. I don't think that's possible. Not impossible, but Starachi's not leaving. And I don't think Griffith's going to go to Iowa. Where's they going to? They gonna bench Ditch Kennedy, Kennedy, Kennedy for one year. <laughs> for one year, like that's that's weird. I don't I don't think any of that's realistic, honestly. In a scenario where Kennedy could place as well. Mm-hmm. Griffith took fifth this year. Yeah. Uh, from Siowa. if Keegan ends up being a four timer, given that Carr beat him twice this year, plus his insanely hard schedule and wins a past champs finalist in years to come, will we consider Carr's season as one of the best of all time? Uh, regardless of no title, well, it it is an incredible season that he had, and the fact that he beat national champion Keegan O'Toole twice, that he beat national champion Shane Griffith, that he beat NCAA finalist Quincy Monday twice, he beat Hamity, like he beat so many good guys this year. Undeniably, one of if not the best seasons without a title. Yeah, like find. I think the challenge side is find. There's certainly seasons of national champions that are not as good as the season David Carr had. Oh, hundred like, percent. Goes, goes without saying. Keegan's going to go down as a, as an all timer. Yeah. And Carr beat him twice. Carr beat him twice. One time very handily. Yeah. Decisively. So I, I would say in the time that wasn't decisively, he pinned him. So, um, I, I would say, yeah, this is find, find an example of a non title season that compares to the one that David had. That culminates with like a loss in the finals, not like a, you know, season ending injury type type of thing. Like he just didn't win on that day. It, it's going to be up there. Great, great season for Carr. I'm ready to stamp it. Greatest non championship season of all time. Yeah, that's the bar. It's been declared. It's the burden of proof is on you, the listener, and dare I say the David Carr hater, to prove JD wrong. I, I, I really don't think you would find maybe David Taylor's. Dake seasons, um, but he never beat Dake. That's the thing. David beat the guy. He was guy. so dominant, though. Um, David was so dominant, but he lost to the guy twice. Yes. Hmm. That's an interesting one. Now I want to think about it more. But besides that, I don't think you're going to find one. Yeah, good luck. What was Gwiz's when he lost to Kyle? Undefeated. I know, but beat surely everyone. he had a decent dominant rate, but not enough that would warrant the fact that he never beat Kyle. He beat he beat Kuhn, uh, which was his big win. Sweet, he a beat, guy who never beat, won it, though. Yeah. Um, still pretty good. That's pretty good, but it's not going to be a Keegan win, and yeah. it's definitely not going to be as good as two Keegan wins. Well, yeah. If he had beaten, yeah. If he had split with Snyder in there, that is a... Snyder's a, a harder guy to beat than, than any of these dudes, right? So, in that way, it's a little tougher. Like you're literally talking about one of the greatest wrestlers who ever lived. Like Kyle Snyder is already Correct. already that, and he was that in 2016. So, um, yeah, he was great Olympic champion by that point. Yeah, no, he, he he was soon to be great Olympic champion. He was soon to be. He was world champion. He was world champion. Great world champion. Like just like I said. Yes, uh, Slink, two and one. Why is Indiana wrestling so underrated? And do you guys think Mendez ever gets it done? I don't know. I think this is just a thing that Indiana people like saying a lot. Like, Indiana's really good. It's, I don't think it, it's up there with Pennsylvania and Ohio and New Jersey, but I. It's properly rated. Yes. <laughs> Everybody is like, no, there are a lot of really good guys that come out of Indiana. It, it shouldn't be up there with New Jersey yeah. and Ohio and Pennsylvania. And maybe that's what he means. He thinks Indiana should be up there. So allow me to with say Slink. Things. I'm sorry, Slink. <laughs> I can't agree with that. But, I mean, Indiana's right there with your your Iowa's and your other states. Probably above Iowa. Let me Illinois. Find, I want to find the by the numbers thing. Um, it had the states and all that. Um, where, where, where the All Americans per state this year? Yeah, yeah. Is, is, Indiana, I feel like off the top of my head, um, a lot of times doesn't get as many like All Americans, but they're always there with a national finalist or a champion. They always have, you know, they always have some high end dudes yeah. for sure. Um, try to find that for me. I'll I'll, tr- I'll try to keep it moving. Um, 
Did Dean get any better at PSU? Um, good find. All right. I won't even entertain it. Let's go. So Indiana. Indiana had three All-Americans. Three All-Americans, which ranked tied for like, I don't know, 10th-ish? Yeah, 11th maybe. Um, they were behind Minnesota, New York, Wisconsin, Iowa, Minnesota, Missouri, Ohio, California, New Jersey, Illinois, Pennsylvania. Okay. It was in reverse order. Reverse ABC order. Scroll, see if there's like a uh, breakdown other way maybe. Breakdown of what? Um, and see, like a, something more historic. Okay, let's look at qualifiers for Indiana. Yeah, there's... seven. Yeah, I'm so... Slink. Like I said, they don't do the bulk numbers, but sorry, Slink. There's always definitely some hammers that come out of Indiana. <laughs> okay, did Dean get any better at Penn State from eighth to second, first to seventh? Uh, this is from Christened. As a sophomore, he beat Miles, who I think at the time was the next topic type guy. Yes, he was. I don't think there was anyone. My mark good his junior year, and he didn't have the senior year. Many thought he was going to have. Uh, so I would say there's a couple of caveats. One, he went from Cornell to Penn State, which are two of the best programs in development, right, um, in college wrestling. They're, they're, Penn State is obviously the top, and Cornell is in that conversation annually. Um, so I'd say that. Two, Maxine is a 184-pounder, right? But Penn State has Aaron Brooks, which made him go 197 outside of his normal, um, his best weight. So, and he still won it one of the years when, you know, he he was a guy who took losses in, in the season, and he took losses during this year as well and just didn't, you know, I you know I predicted he would he would win it um, going into NCAs this year. I felt like yeah he'll he'll figure it out, put it together. It didn't happen, um, but I think it's tough to say a guy who had his all time placement at a school out of his ideal weight class didn't get better. So I would say he definitely did, and I would say I definitely don't think he got worse. Definitely don't think he got worse. I definitely would say, but I'm also not going to say that had Max Dean gone to or stayed at it's Cornell mm -hmm. that he wouldn't have been able to win a national title at 197 that year as well but he would have gone 184 almost certainly and probably would not have beaten Aaron Brooks I don't think um so I would say he did get better but I would also say he probably would have done just fine at, at Cornell very obviously um so I, I don't think there's um I mean he won a freaking title right and this year didn't play out how he thought but he's not a 197 pounder Okay, so this is uh, from AZ Wrestling Fan. I know Jaden is prioritizing the Olympics, but wouldn't he be better off staying at 92 this year, getting a medal and possibly another world title? Yes, he gives up the chance to go straight to Final X next year, but if he wins a medal, doesn't he go directly for semis for trials? Yeah, he does, but like, I don't feel like semis to try in trials is like that big of a deal, really, especially 97. He did lose to Nate Jackson at Final X. True. Well, that's someone he so, could. That's someone he could start his tournament with at, not at the trials. I think, I think it's not just about the potential positioning of making, uh, you know, having the potential to sit out. But I think it's also like, let me have a two year run at trying to be this weight class and being big and not having to. Cause like ninety two, ninety seven sounds close, but it's like you know, like an eleven, twelve pound difference, right? So that's that's substantial. So he can get big, stay big, stay at the same weight class. He's won world titles. He's already done those things. He needs to get on the Olympic team again. That's like the goal. So I get it. Yeah, he could win another world title. It would make Team USA better. Yes, yes, yes. But I think it's, you know, time to cement his weight class and stay at 97. So I, th I think it makes sense. I agree. Um... All right, next question. Which transfer in the last decade or so has had the biggest impact on the team they transferred to? Um, Bryce Meredith? Meredith. He, did, he didn't really have a lasting impact, but for Wyoming to get an NCAA finalist like mm -hmm. him. Two-time finalist, right? Now, if Michigan would have won, it would have been Nikki Wolverine. Nikki Wolverine. But th then again, are they second without Nikki Wolverine? True, probably Nick, not. 
Nikki Cornrows, I think. Uh, well, I don't think they would have got second. They may have still got a trophy. Yeah. But I don't think it would have second. They wouldn't have won Big Tens. That's true. They wouldn't have won Big Tens. So he's high. <laughs> I think. The, I was going to say Soriano for Rutgers. They got Ashnall that same I know, year, though. But that was such a moment. They had two national champions the same year. Like, that's, that, is, that is an insane accomplishment. Um, how many teams have won, two, have won two national titles the same year? Like, it does not happen that often. True. You, because you see it every year with Penn State. You think it's just this thing that many teams do, but really hard to get one. Getting two is, like, mind-blowing. And if you don't recall, Nikki, uh, Nikki Rutgers was the first national champion for Rutgers. <laughs> he was, by, like, an hour. Yes. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I think him, um, you know, looking at, I think DeSanto or Jay Nyerman were huge for Iowa. I don't think they... True. Uh, I think they would have still won maybe in 2021 without one of them. Um, I'd have to like do subtraction and stuff and also remember what the team scores were, but those were, those were high impact for sure to get those guys. Um, I mean, Max Dean was big for, for Penn state last year. Um, if they don't have Max Dean. Do they win last year? I don't know. Well, the thing is also, do they pick up somebody else? Well, so. well, no, they just keep beard. Yeah, and who knows? Beard doesn't transfer out. <laughs> Beard doesn't transfer out. So it's like you maybe subtract like first place minus like six place points, and maybe then... zero points. We didn't see Beard, the He's... guy who beat Dean this year. I know, and he was round of twelve this year, so you don't really know. That uh, way, yeah, you right, really fine. don't know. The thing about Nicky's is too, is that he it was one of the first also transfers. This isn't for the program they transferred to, but in terms of just. Kind of opening up the the gates a little bit, the transfers. Um, Nicky did that, and he took on Caleb Penn State. He fought the man. Well, like also he, uh, yeah, he's just like, no, I'm not gonna do the Big Ten to Big Ten thing where I sit a year, guys. Yes, I'm actually gonna do it twice, and I will never sit unless I want to. Um, no, so Penn State won by so many points in 2022. They won by 36 ish points. So. Three six and a half, so they could have not had Max Dean and still won by like twenty points. That's insane. Okay, um, so yeah, it's, it's one of the Suriano transfers. Or okay, let's subtract twenty points from Michigan. They go down to seventy five. They would have got. They would have still been second place outright. Iowa just only had seventy four points last year. Okay. Oh, man, this is interesting. <laughs> is Kale the single most important person ever in wrestling from what he did on the mat, NCA, and world level to now coaching? Well, I think there's a case. Um, most important person ever. I mean, I think Dan Gable is still so iconic uh, to the sport and what he did as an athlete, competitor, and coach. He the biggest role in bringing wrestling back from Olympic death. That might be, that might be it. I don't know. That was, that was just a collective effort. And maybe it was just in, in all, also when, when the IOC kicked wrestling out in 13, it's, I think it was more of a, a shot across the bow. Maybe it was more of a fight than we realized. We fought wrestling fought like it was going to happen. Like we have to fight or we're going to get eliminated. But how much of it was the IOC just being like, all right, let's, we got to, they have some crooks in charge. We got to get them out. They've got to wake up, snap out of it. And it was a shot across the bow and let's get wrestling will always remain, but blah, blah. So I think it could have been partially that, but um, I do think that was more of a collective effort. Um, man, he, Kale, Kale's certainly up there with his impact um, as a competitor, as an athlete that, that won the Olympics, that won four titles and now is what he's doing coaching. It, it'll be a more interesting question in 15 years when... There's also maybe a difference between impactful and important. Yeah. I Like, important is a weird word. Like, is Kale winning all of these things important for wrestling? Does any of this really matter? <laughs> like, um, influential versus important. Is yeah. he, what, he is arguably one of, if not the most influential people, at least in the past, you know, 30 years. 
but important. This may be another word. Yeah. I mean, he certainly, and I think his his impact will grow as um, his coaching tree continues to branch out. And and so far, he's kept it pretty. The the branches are just they're all in State College, Pennsylvania, primarily. A few have uh, moved on, but mostly they're all there. I, I would say as his biggest impact could be his impact on training and development and and how that is viewed by wrestling coaches it but of course the whole thing is like we don't exactly know how they're doing it but that could be the biggest impact and and i still think it's impactful because people will get the gist like less is more um they're the importance of gratitude having fun etc like there are little things that that get out that i think are but um for the time being is still largely unknown but yeah, impact's been huge. And he's changed how wrestling looks, I think, in a lot of ways. Um, when you look at some of the athletes that, that have come out from there. Why is ankle ride so important now? Uh, yeah. yeah. Ankle ride. <laughs> ankle ride's done. I, I think it's going to get... Well, that's how everything goes in wrestling yeah. is it has its moment for a couple of years. And it gets so popular that you have to figure out how to defend it. And people figure out ways to defend it. So then it becomes, I want to say obsolete, but... Its impact definitely goes And down. in 15 years, people start ankle riding again, and we'll be like, dude, no one can stop this ride. And it's like, no, you can stop anything if you put your mind to it, JD. Remember that. Okay. Um, yeah, I think the ankle ride over the next couple of years will start to phase out, and people will be like, okay, you just need to do this. And you'll get away. Uh, the ACC has quality wrestling but needs more team in its conference. Who would you like to see join the ACC? I don't know. I don't know. The ACC is kind of awesome. I mean, I would love to see if they they mean add teams. Okay, there's a lot of, of potential like Clemson for, for them to State. add programs for sure. Um, Syracuse had a program at one point. The Qs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Any any of them really? I think I think Georgia Tech would be awesome. I have a team in the South there. Another team in the South. But uh, yeah, I'm not I'm not picky. You're just tired of all of uh, Coach Anthony Roby stealing all the uh, good Georgia recruits. Anthony Roby, no, love get all the Georgians. <laughs> Anthony, um, okay. Any other questions here? Um, oh wait, there's some. Do we see any roofers at the U.S. Open this year? Absolutely, always is. Absolutely, and if you don't know, when we say roofers, we just mean a roofer could be a CPA. It could be some. It could be a dietitian. It could be. It could be a, a carpenter. Just someone who has no business wrestling against the best in the world, but they enter anyways. Like it's just like a local tournament. But they're actually entering the U.S. Open for some reason. I don't understand it. It's some sort of masochistic uh, impulse that some people have to just go and get stunted on by some of the best. And maybe you can say, "Hey, I took the mat against this person." Uh, and it is a weird aspect of the sport. You know, you can't just go hoop with LeBron James, but there's a chance you could wrestle, you know, Nick Soriano. You could wrestle, uh, you know, Jordan Burroughs. So, you know, I think uh, I think we will always see these people. And, uh, you know, it's kind of beautiful. And uh, I, have <laughs> Poetic, no, I have no shame in, in highlighting their uh, their attempts. But look... It's great if if you want to you know chase your world or Olympic dream, um, at, at at an older age, but you need to be prepared to come to get dunked on with the repercussions. Yeah, that's only fair. That's fair. Like I don't, I'm not gonna hate you for you know to enter, chasing your dream and yeah. doing what you want to do and competing against uh, you know some of the best in the world. But if you get dunked on, you got to prepare for us to dunk on you. Redunk. Well, I would just also say like. To enter a tournament is a declaration of intent. I'm here to compete. I'm here to win. I'm here to I, I that's why you enter a thing, right? So if you do that, it's like, all right, you're kind of putting your you're you are putting yourself on a level, right? We're not putting you there. No one's asking JD to enter the open. He he'd be far more qualified than than some of the uh the, the entries you see. Oh, it's fine. You can enter, but we we will we will we will chuckle. Um all right, 
This has been good. Very good show. Quality Wednesday show. Ben maybe will be back. But maybe he has just moved to St. Louis. I don't know. St. Lunatics. Yeah. Shout out to them. Mark Bader partied with the St. Lunatics one yes, time. Yes, he did. He did. Um, that's a story for another day. We're going to get the heck out of here. We got tacos waiting for us, I bet. Let's see. Um, Kozak hooked us up. Oh, yeah. John, Jonathan Kozak. He's getting our tacos. He says, I've been blessed to be a blessing. Amen, brother. Hey, thank you guys so much for tuning in. We'll be back tomorrow. Ben's back. You're back. It's going to be great. Talk some more rules. Who knows what we'll talk about. Who knows what Ben's up to. Thank you guys so much. See you tomorrow. Bye.